Hi guys, this is Jonathan Jensen here at TheEssentialVermeer.com. Here's my take on Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. Well, it's actually a bit of my confession too, because I admit, every time I pay a visit to the girl, I'm disappointed. I look at her, she looks back at me, I look at her again, and then she looks back at me again. This goes on for a while, but we really never get much of a conversation going. Sounds absurd, but I find her more attractive in reproductions. Maybe that's because she's just too iconic, too all over the place. Novels, films, book covers, magazine ads, tacky merchandise, millions of lookalikes and quadrillions of dressalikes. You may just wonder when this avalanche will ever stop. Am I a chauvinist, an apostate, a snob, an elitist? Perhaps, even though I'm not too sure that's really where my problem is. The milkmaid is iconic too. I've stood in front of it so many times and gawked at it for so many hours on my monitor, it seems impossible there's anything left to discover. Until, until I stand face to face with a real picture again. The last time that happened at the Rijksmuseum Vermeer retrospective, I was speechless. The painting glows with its own light. It's the closest thing to traveling in a time machine back to a sunny 17th century kitchen in Delft. To be perfectly honest, I prefer the metropolitan study of the young women, if you may, the girl's spiritual sister. Yes, she's anything but a public favorite, but her dreamy lunar beauty, her midnight luminosity and infinite tenderness shuts me down. And despite the picture's deceptive simplicity, it's one of the most sophisticated examples of painting technique in Vermeer's entire oeuvre. The touch is simply beyond delicate. I'd love to see the two pictures hanging next to each other. Unfortunately, that won't happen anytime soon because she has to stay put in the Metropolitan. But if we could, I bet we'd discover she's just as fascinating as her iconic sister and that the two pictures belong to each other, like the Earth and the Moon. Well, dream on, Jonathan. Anyway, this video is about the girl. The girl with the pearl earring may have looked quite different when it sat on Vermeer's easel 350 years ago. When it was rediscovered in 1881, it was in a dreadful state, mauled by aggressive overcleanings, extensive retouching, and who knows what else. The once lively texture of the painting surface has been flattened by hot irons used to reline the canvas. The cheeks have probably lost a bit of pink glaze, and here and there, the transitions between light and shadow seem a bit harsh. The dark line that divides the lower edge of the jaw from the neck strikes me as a trifle overdone. A faded glaze or two would have probably made the turban seem a little bit rounder. And the Moritz house has recently discovered behind the figure Vermeer had painted a green curtain with broad sweeping folds, degraded into the dark murky gray that we see today. She even had some eyelashes. So how would the painting have looked? Obviously it's impossible to say, but how could I resist? Here's one of my late night Photoshop fantasies. Don't take it too seriously. So, who was she? She looks a little bit like the Muse of Fame in the Art of Painting, but then again not all that much. I find much more convincing lookalikes in the girl reading a letter at an open window and the woman in blue reading a letter, or even the two androgynous faces of the girl with the flute and the girl with the red hat. You may see things very differently though. Extracting likenesses from painted heads is tricky business. People tend to disagree often quite passionately. It's hard to say how old she is. This isn't really too surprising. Although she looks astoundingly real, her features are highly generalized. There's really not much of a nose, just a soft shadow cast to its right. It's there because you know it's there, not because you really see it's there. And her expression is even more uncertain. If you read through the small mountain of literature dedicated to the picture, you find her described as avid, generous, sensual, childish, seductive, innocent, coquettish, sincere, erotic, wistful, all-engaging, oblique, beguiling, and yearning, or perfectly objective, patient, idealized, classical. The amazing disparity of interpretations may be the key to the painting's immense popularity, somewhat like a Rorschach inkblot test which reveals who you are rather than what you see. A number of art historians credit this as one of Vermeer's highest poetic achievements. 
his ability to create apparently straightforward and self-explanatory images that somehow awaken the different inclinations and personal experiences of each spectator. Could she have been the painter's daughter? Well, Vermeer did have various daughters. We know their names, but we have no idea what they looked like, or even if they cared about painting. But if you insist, the only viable candidate is Maria, born around 1654. Art historians date the picture between 1664 and 1667, so she would have been 10 to 13 years old when her father made the painting. But like every other person who modeled for Vermeer, there's not a single document that connects the girl's face to a name. So anything you hear about who posed for the girl with the pearl earring may be a nice story, but it's really just a nice story. We don't know who the girl was, period. Of course, it's only natural we wish to know more about the artists' lives and the stories behind their great works of art. However, I think we should be wary about traveling too far down this road. A passage from Proust's In Search of Lost Time comes to mind, in which the coquette Odette, intent on seducing the intellectual swan, tries to share his interests and passions. Knowing he was writing an essay on Vermeer, she inquired whether the artist had suffered for a woman, whether it had been a woman who inspired him. When Swan confessed he knew nothing about it, she completely lost interest in the painter. And I think there is a flip side to the mantra, anything that brings people closer to art must be good. It's true that the novel and film Girl with a Pearl Earring brought the painting to the attention of millions who had no idea it ever existed, but I believe at a cost. According to the most trustworthy research, Vermeer's wife, Katharina, shared at least 22 years of her life with the painter and bore him 15 children. In order to follow Katharina in her faith, the painter converted to Catholicism, a life event that would not have been taken lightly in 17th century Protestant Netherlands. And she probably posed for at least four of his most tender renditions of female form and psyche. His mother-in-law, Maria Thins, supported the artist and his ballooning family steadfastly and kept them afloat in the time of the ruinous war with France, which had financially brought the painter to his knees. Peter van Ruyven, and perhaps even more so his wife, Maria de Knut, were the principal enablers of Vermeer's art. They had purchased nearly two-thirds of his known output and bequeathed the painter with a sizable sum of 500 guilders, granting him the freedom to paint as he pleased. No other client-patron relationship in the Netherlands seems to have been so close or so productive. Instead, many of those who were inspired by the film but doubt no further, perhaps the majority, will remember Van Royven as a lecher, Maria de Knut as a submissive to her husband Ogre, Maria Thins as the Wicked Witch of the West, and Katharina, a self-centered narcissist utterly incapable of comprehending the significance of her husband's art, she even attempted to destroy the girl with a pearl earring. Of course, imagination is a big part of what art is all about, but unless managed with care, imagination can lead us quite far away from what Vermeer intended to say and blindside us to the debt of gratitude that I think we owe to those who played such a constructive role in Vermeer's artistic development. Furthermore, the identity of the model may not have been particularly important to Vermeer because the painting isn't a portrait, or at least a portrait in the 17th century sense of the term. Portraits in Vermeer's times were made for posterity, a part of the family heirloom, stylish but sober projections of pride and social position, by far the most conservative category of painting, averse to experimentation and innovation. The quest for the most accurate likeness possible overrode any other concern. So the everyday garment, the slightly outlandish turban, the departed lips and the bared teeth and the girl with the pearl earring would have immediately disqualified her as a portrait. Try as you may, you'll probably never find a portrait of a Dutch woman with an open mouth. So it's out of the question. The girl with the pearl earring was not made as a portrait. Then what is it? Well, a Dutchman of the time would have immediately recognized it as a trony, and now the defunct term that refers to heads or faces, they were meant as studies of particularly interesting characters, gestures or expressions, an old man, a young woman, a Turk, a dashing soldier, and so on. Garments that looked foreign, antique, costly, or simply curious were of interest for their own sake and offered opportunities to show off painterly techniques. 
Despite their popularity, the Troni, however, wasn't a particularly esteemed category of painting. As far as subject matter goes, the Troni was really near the bottom of the ladder, above scenes of tavern brawls or animal paintings, but below portraiture or pictures of mythological or biblical subject matter. It's precisely that loose anything goes character that made the Troni extremely popular for both painters and art lovers. And although Tronies were usually done from live models, whether acting a part or sitting as themselves, the actual identity of the model was unimportant. By the way, when Vermeer painted the girl, he may have had in mind similar works by the Brussels painter Michael Swierz. The candor, the immediacy and sensitive handling of light in Swierz's tronies suggest a reasonable kinship. Swierz occasionally painted figures with turbans too, but he generally painted commoners like Vermeer's girl. And how about that pearl? By now, specialists have agreed it was a fake, made perhaps of varnished glass. A drop pearl of similar dimensions would have rivaled those of the most illustrious pearl of the world, La Peregrina, discovered in the mid-1660s, worn by European monarchs and eventually acquired by Richard Burton for Liz Taylor for the modest sum of $11.8 million. So Vermeer's pearl would have been astronomically expensive, wildly out of reach of his limited financial means. But we can't exclude it was invented out of thin air, because if you get up close enough, from what a distance appears to be a pearl sweetly dangling in the penumbra is actually two dabs of paint and a bit of smudging. There's no clip that fastens it to the ear, no outline, you can't even see the pearl's body, like the one we see in the mistress then made, just a thick blob of white paint that reflects light from an unseen window to the left and a comet-shaped smudge of light gray below, which reflects the dimmer light of the young girl's white chemise. And that's it. The most illustrious pearl in the world is just two dabs of sticky paint. If that's not magic, really, what is? Important for understanding Vermeer's intentions, we should keep in mind tronies were produced for the open market and sold on spec in the painter's studio, and they were cheap. In an auction of 21 works by Vermeer held in 1696, two decades after the painter's death, the milkmaid, which is about as big as the girl, was sold for the respectable sum of 175 guilders. That's five times more than a work described in the auction catalog as a trony in antique dress, uncommonly artful, which some art historians believe is the girl. So is the girl with the pearl earring a masterpiece or not? It depends on how you think. In 1911, only 30 years after the painting was rediscovered, Edward Pleach compared it to nothing less than Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, after generations, it's still referred to as the Mona Lisa of the North. In 1921, she was the star of the Great Exhibition at the Paris Gilles de Palme. In 1929, she was reproduced on the cover of the catalog of an exhibition of Dutch painting in London. The painter Jan Veth later wrote, More than with any other work by Vermeer, it looks as if blended from the dust of crushed pearls. In 1979, Edward Snow dedicated three pages to it in the prologue of his Vermeer monograph. In medieval times, a masterpiece was a work produced to obtain membership of a guild or an academy, but by the 1660s it began to be used as we do today. An artwork of elevated technical quality that's particularly meaningful, profound, or creative, especially one that's considered the artist's greatest work. Sounds fairly straightforward, but let's not forget there is no objective criteria for evaluating creativity, meaning, or profundity. And there exist many works of art that are exceptionally skillful, but are not masterworks. And I know this doesn't sound too edifying, but we should keep in mind, in the 17th century, painting was also a business. And Vermeer was a practical man. He worked squarely within the artistic framework of his time. His tastes were aligned with those of a financial and cultural elite. He traded in pictures of his colleagues and was elected two times head of the Guild of St. Luke in Delft, a highly respected position where diplomatic skills would have been necessary. On the side, he did business for his mother-in-law and managed an inn inherited from his father. So even though Vermeer's aspirations were sky high, his feet were firmly attached to the ground. When he sat down at his easel and began to paint the girl, I seriously doubt he was banking on creating a masterpiece, much less a planetary icon. 
I'd love to see the look on his face if he could see the queue that snaked around the Fifth Avenue Freak Collection, waiting patiently to catch a glimpse of his trony girl in a special exhibition. It's more likely his aims were to study a particular light on a particular girl dressed in a particular way and make a saleable painting that would allow him room to experiment with a looser, more abbreviated technique, and perhaps take a short vacation from his incredibly labor-intensive interior scenes which demanded months of unremitting application. Just in case you're looking for Vermeer's bid for eternal fame, his masterpiece, go no further than his large-scale art of painting with its incredibly ambitious composition and learned symbolic references. So in the end, what is and what isn't a masterpiece really boils down to who thinks a work of art is a masterpiece. For centuries, the task of evaluating works of art was monopolized by a small group of elite connoisseurs, today by art critics and trained art historians. Public opinion merely follows or ignores their indications. So what am I getting at here? What am I really trying to say? Of course, I'm not trying to tell anyone one of the most beloved paintings in the world is not a masterpiece because a masterpiece must meet some sort of canonical standard. We are, after all, in the 21st century, and at its most fundamental level, most of us believe the appreciation of a work of art remains an individual and highly subjective experience. But the iconization of the girl may have blown the painting out of proportion. Yes, she's in a league of her own, one of the few paintings that's achieved universal recognition. But I believe this has to some degree distorted what were probably Vermeer's intentions, and perhaps even the painting's artistic merit. Luckily, it's unlikely she'll wind up any time soon behind the bulletproof glass meters away from visitors' eyes like the Mona Lisa. The Maritz House is not the Louvre and the Hague is not a global art mecca. There are still many times you can have the painting all for yourself, at least at the Hague. So let's try to keep it that way and take one less selfie and perhaps one more look at the picture. And a nice long one. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Jonathan Jansen here at TheEssentialVermeer.com.